Hello, my name is Jochem Evers, and in this presentation I would like to um, give you some background information on the uh, theory as well as modeling of resource capture in species diverse uh, crop systems. Such intercrops um, are all about mixing species for more efficient uh, land and resource use, and they come in um, different shapes and sizes. Um, for example, the fully mixed systems, as you can see an example uh, of on the bottom left, uh, which is a system um, in which uh, two species are fully mixed within the field, so no distinct uh, row structure. Um, in this case, it's pea and barley. Uh, in the middle, you can see a, a typical strip intercropping system. Uh, this is wheat soybean, uh, and in this particular case, the two species have been sown uh, simultaneously. So this is a simultaneous strip intercropping system, whereas the one on the right is a relay system. This is uh, cotton and, and wheat, and in this particular system, um, wheat is sown first, and while it's maturing, cotton is sown. Um, so in the end, the the uh, the total growing season is uh, is very long, spanning uh, the growth seasons of both species. Uh, the same is true for the picture in the background. This is a maize wheat system, and also in this system, uh, one of the species is sown first, which is wheat, and uh, the maize is sown later. Now, there are many reasons why such intercrops, such combinations of species, would uh, give more efficient land and, uh, and resource use, and this is sort of summarized in this uh, in this picture. Um, it mostly has to do with the fact that um, either species are uh, complementary in their resource use, so they're not searching for the same resource in the same place at the same time necessarily. Uh, that makes them complementary. The resources are used more uh, efficiently. There are also cases in which one species is uh, actually helping the other species to acquire a certain resource. Uh, for example, by uh, acidifying the soil and uh, making phosphorus more available for the other species. Um, uh, but overall, it, is, uh, it depends on the exact species composition of the intercrop, um, which mechanisms are taking care of the, uh, of the benefits that the intercrop uh, may provide. In this presentation, I would like to focus on um, competition for the uh, for the primary resources uh, for plants, which is uh, light, water, and uh, nutrients. First, I will treat um, above ground competition for light. And to do this, I would like to present to you the example of the wheat cotton intercropping system. Uh, this is a system, um, a relay system, uh, and these four pictures that you can see here are four different stages of. Um, this particular intercrop. So on the top left, you can see the strips of wheat uh, growing, flowering already, and the uh, strips where the cotton is supposed to be are still empty. Then on the top right, you can see uh, the situation after uh, cotton has been uh, has been sown, the wheat is maturing, and the cotton plants are are, are growing. On the bottom left, you can see um, harvest of the of the wheat in this system. So this is one of the few intercropping systems that can be. Uh, partially managed uh, mechanically, as you can see here. Uh, the wheat can be harvested without uh, without uh, damaging the, the cotton plants. Uh, and then the bottom right, you can see uh, the cotton plants uh, growing vegetatively. Uh, and you can also see some of the wheat stubble in the middle. And then later on in the season, the cotton will actually cover most of the field. Um, wheat cotton intercrops can be grown uh, in different ways and different uh, configurations of the, uh, the rows of the different species. Uh, and this was tested in, um, in this particular paper by uh, Jung et al. in 2007. Uh, top left you can see a system where there are three wheat rows uh, alternating with single uh, cotton rows. So the strips of wheat are uh, three rows and the strips of cotton are only one row. Uh, bottom right, uh, top right you can see uh, a three-row wheat system alternating with two rows of, of cotton. Bottom left is a system where there are four wheat rows and two cotton rows, and bottom right, six wheat rows and two cotton rows. And these are the, uh, the results from this experiment in terms of, uh, of yields per species. So 
what you can see here is the uh, the wheat yield for the four different cropping patterns as well as the uh, the cotton yield for the four intercropping patterns and also the um, the yields for the uh, for the cotton and wheat um, soil crops so monocultures and of course in all cases the uh, the yields in the intercrop are lower than in the in the soil systems both for wheat and cotton but it is of course important to realize that in intercropping systems these species are present both uh, they're both present in the field uh, in contrast to the to the soil system so that means that uh, if you want to calculate the yield for the system you can actually add them such performance of an entire intercrop is usually expressed using the term land equivalent ratio um, that is the sum of the relative yields of both species um, so that means that um, the relative yield of wheat in this case which is the wheat yield in the intercrop divided by the wheat yield in the soil crop uh, is added to the relative yield of the cotton which is the cotton yield in the intercrop divided by the cotton yield um, in the soil crop and you can see that for these uh, for different intercropping systems, uh, the value of that land equivalent ratio is ranging between 1.27 and 1.39. And this means that um, these intercropping systems, uh, they are overyielding, uh, which means that if you want to get a similar yield from uh, soil crops, you would need, for example, for the first cropping pattern, you would need 36% more land to achieve the same yield um, in soil crop um, as in the in the intercrop. Here you can see some more examples of what typical LER values uh, may be for wheat maize systems ranging between 1.2 and 1.6 for wheat soybean systems also a very popular combination uh, ranging between 1.23 and 1.26 and faba bean maize systems going up to 1.34 um, so these are all well-known combinations of species and intercropping systems that give a, a land equivalent ratio um, well above one. So resource uh, land efficient systems. So let's have a look at an example of, uh, of calculating land equivalent ratio for a, uh, for a hypothetical uh, monoculture and intercrop. Here we can see um, some species A that has been uh, yielding 10 tons per hectare in monoculture and species B is doing four tons per hectare so it's a different species and an intercrop uh, in which the proportion of both species A and species B is 50 percent so this is a 50-50 a intercrop uh, the yield of species A is six tons per hectare and the yield of species B is, is two and a half tons per hectare so these values are lower than the respective uh, yields in a monoculture which of course makes sense because they are only present on half of the land so the yields must be lower uh, but they're not half of it they're not half of the monoculture yields uh, and this is what we see when we calculate the relative yields uh, the relative yields for species a is uh, 6 divided by 10 uh, so the the yield in intercrop divided by the yield in monocrop which is 0 0.6 uh, whereas we based on the uh, land proportion um, that species a is taken up in the intercrop we expected a, a yield a relative yield to be 0 0.5 same goes for species b um, it gets to a relative yield of 0 0.625 whereas uh, expected from um, the monoculture yields that would be 0 0.5 so in fact both species in this case are um, are over yielding which then leads to uh, a land equivalent ratio of uh, 1.225 for this uh, particular hypothetical system uh, and here's another example. Um, in this case, uh, species A and B, they do the same in, uh, in the monoculture in terms of their yield. But now in the intercrop, species A is, uh, is uh, giving 7.5 tons per hectare and species B is only giving 1.5 tons per hectare. And this, of course, has uh, repercussions for the relative yields. So the relative yields for species A in this case is 0 0.75, whereas 0 0.5 is expected based on the, on, the, on the land use proportion. But for species B, the, um, the relative yield is below 0 0.5. It's actually doing worse in the intercrop uh, as a value of 0 0.375. Still, in this case, the LER is above one. So uh, this means that the advantage that, the, uh, that species A is, uh, is getting in the intercrop is more than compensating for the uh, negative effect that the intercrop 
uh, appears to have on species B, resulting in an LER uh, still well above one. And it's important to realize that uh, an LER of a certain value, for example, 1.4 does not necessarily mean that you get 40% more yield. Uh, that is something else. Uh, for example, in this case, where the species A and B, they uh, give six tons per hectare and 0 0.8 tons per hectare uh, in the intercrop. Um, the LER, as you can see in this calculation, is 1.4. Um, but the extra, the extra yield that you get is not 40%. Uh, this 1.4 means that you need 40% 40 40 more land in monoculture to get the same yields as in the intercrop. But the actual overyielding is less than that. It's 24% because the yield expected is 50% of the monoculture yield of species 1 plus 50% of the monoculture yield of species uh, B, uh, which then is uh, 5 plus 0 0.5 is 5.5 tons per hectare. Uh, the actual yield that was realized in the intercrop was 6 plus 0 0.8, so 6.8 tons per hectare, which means that the overyielding, the amount of extra yield that you get is 1.3 tons per hectare, which is 24%. And uh, clearly that's something different than the 40% that we calculated earlier. So those are two different things. Uh, the LER indicates how much more land you need in monoculture to get the same, uh, the same yields as an intercrop. And that is something else than the amount of, uh, or the fraction of extra yield that you get. Now, if we go back to the uh, the wheat cotton intercropping system, um, the paper of uh, Jangadal showed that uh, this high performance, this LAR of uh, well above 1.2, was um, not could not be traced back to a higher light use efficiency of the intercropped wheat and cotton. It was actually the same as in monoculture. So the light use efficiency, the conversion of of, um, of radiation into biomass, uh, was not different. Uh, but actually, the uh, the biggest contributor to uh, these high LERs were, uh, was the, the total light interception of the system. It was much higher than in either of the monocultures. Um, for example, the intercropped wheat intercepted 70 to 80 percent of the light compared to sole wheat. Um, and intercropped cotton intercepted, uh, well, uh, 67 to 93 of the light compared to sole cotton, um, whereas their, uh, their land use proportion uh, was lower than that. Now, the big question is, why? Why does this system intercept so much more light than, uh, than the monocultures? Well, one of the reasons for this is that uh, typically in strip intercrops, there's many borders. So there's uh, many places in the field where um, the two species um, can interact. Uh, They're adjacent to each other. Uh, and you can see this very clearly from uh, the pictures on this slide. Uh, these are photos for three different stages of a wheat maize intercrop. Uh, this is from an experiment that we did a couple of years ago in Wageningen. Um, in the first picture, you can see an early stage where uh, the wheat uh, is flowering and the maize plants are still small. Uh, in the second picture, you can see that the maize plants are overtaking the wheat plants in terms of uh, height growth and in the third picture the wheat plants have been harvested and the maize plants are uh, are flowering so if you then observe the differences in yield between um, the different rows uh, you can see tremendous differences uh, here if we look at wheat um, you can see that um, the border wheat rows so the rows that are next to the maize rows um, they yielded much more, here expressed in grams per meter of row, uh, than the inner rows, the rows that are uh, more in, uh, towards the middle of the, of the strip. Um, and this is um, a clear effect of these uh, wheat plants being at the border. The, the maize plants are still small, so the wheat plants have been able to access, uh, access resources um, um, much better than the plants in the middle of the strip. And one of these resources is light. Um, in this uh, graph, you can see the fraction of photosynthetically active radiation at soil level uh, over time, over thermal time in this case. And there's three lines in there. Um, there's the line with the open diamonds for sole wheat. Um, you can see a very typical uh, pattern of decreasing light as the canopy uh, uh, develops over time. Uh, it goes uh, all the way down to around 0 0.1 at soil level. 
Um, you can see the same pattern if you do these light measurements in the middle of an intercrop wheat strip. So those are the open circles. Uh, you can also see this, uh, this data going down over time. But if you measure in between the wheat and the maize strip, so basically next to the border wheat row, uh, you can see that initially the light, uh, the fraction of, uh, of light is going down, but then it, it stalls for a bit and stays at a, a level of around 0.6 something, and then goes down later as the, uh, as the maize starts to develop. Um, so this extra light is available um, for wheat plants uh, at the border uh, to grow better than the plants in the middle of the strip. Well, this extra resource availability, in this case light, um, is there because the maize plants um, are planted or are sown later than the, than the wheat plants. Um, and this is um, the second important reason why strip intercrops uh, can result in, can give much higher light capture than corresponding monocrops. And this is called the temporal niche differentiation. Here you can see a couple of, uh, of examples for uh, uh, different levels of temporal niche differentiation. Um, for example, in the, uh, in the first example, the spring wheat soybean intercrop Spring wheat is uh, sown somewhere in March and harvested in August, while soybean sown uh, by the end of April and harvested uh, by the end of August. Uh, you can see that the overlap is relatively large, which means that the temporal niche differentiation is small. <coughs> There's little differentiation in their temporal niches. Um, temporal niche differentiation is bigger uh, for intercrops with a smaller overlap. As you can see in the middle example of spring wheat and, and spring maize. <coughs> and for a full relay intercrop, um, you can see uh, that the temporal niche differentiation can be uh, really large. Uh, in this case, uh, the wheat uh, cotton intercrop that we saw before, there's only very little uh, overlap between uh, the two component species, uh, which gives a very large differentiation in temporal niches. You can see that the, the definition of temporal niche differentiation, it is basically the fraction of total crop system duration uh, in which no component crops overlap. So uh, it can be calculated by taking the total system duration and the uh, amount of time uh, of uh, overlap, of co-growth of, of component species and dividing that by the, the uh, so the difference between these two and then divided by the, uh, the system duration, which gives you the temporal niche differentiation. And this then means that your TND, your temporal niche differentiation is zero in the case of, of fully overlapping uh, crops. And it's one in the case where there is no overlap at all. Next to uh, the number of border rows in the system and the temporal niche differentiation, there's a third very important reason why strip intercrops would, um, would give a higher light capture in total compared to monocrops. And that reason is plant plasticity. Um, it is not only that the plants at the borders intercept more light because they're at the border, they're also responding to being at the border. Um, for example, in the case of these wheat plants, uh, what's happening is that these plants at the border, they produce many more tillers, so many more uh, branches. Uh, you can clearly see this in this graph here where you see the number of tillers per plant on the y-axis and the uh, thermal time again on the x-axis. And uh, yeah, the line for the border row, so the top one, you can clearly see that the number of tillers go up over time and then stay at a relatively high level. So these plants have around five uh, tillers on average per plant, whereas uh, the plants in the middle of the strip and also the sole wheat plants, their tiller number goes down over time so a couple of tillers are made that actually die off because there's not enough resources for them to grow uh, leading to much lower tiller numbers so here you can clearly see a plastic response of plants to uh, being at the border which then um, amplifies the uh, light the extra light capture that you get from uh, from being at the border and having access to more radiation this plasticity this plasticity can also be seen in, in leaf area. Uh, here we can see the leaf area on the y-axis and leaf rank, so, so position of the leaf on the plant on the, uh, the x-axis. And uh, well, for border rows, um, 
we can see that the top leaves, so leaves six, seven, eight, and, and higher, they are much larger than um, the ones uh, than on plants that are in the inner rows. Uh, so this is also a plastic response to, uh, to being at the border. These plants have more tillers, and the leaves on those tillers are also bigger, which results in an even higher uh, light capture by these border plants. And this then results in these, uh, these uh, much higher yields of border plants compared to plants uh, in the middle of the strip and also compared to plants in a, in a monoculture. And, and this actually raised the question, uh, knowing that there's a couple of factors involved in the high capture of light in the strip intercrops. Um, we were wondering, what is then the contribution of these individual factors? For example, plant plasticity. Um, how much does plant plasticity contribute to the extra light capture that you get in, uh, in such a strip intercrop? And um, here is where the, uh, the modeling comes in, because disentangling these factors is, is uh, pretty difficult to do in an experiment. You would need to have plants that do not respond plastically um, to, to quantify uh, the effect of uh, the borders and the temporal niche differentiation separately from the plant plasticity. Um, uh, but that is not so uh, so easy to do. So we opted for a, a modeling approach. And this is a, uh, a 3D modeling approach in which the intercrops, their spatial and temporal heterogeneity is uh, recreated virtually. So on the computer, and you can see a couple of uh, stills here of the, uh, the simulation of this intercrop. Uh, on the top, you can see the wheat strips. So the plants in the wheat strip emerging at the beginning um, and as uh, the wheat plants grow, at some point the maize plants uh, start to grow as well. Um, and later on, the maize plants overtake the wheat plants in terms of height. And then at the end, at some point, the wheat plants are taken away and then the maize plants uh, uh, get mature. And this model then allows you to do things that are not uh, so easy to do in an experiment. Uh, for example, for this particular study, uh, to try and find out what is the contribution contribution of plant plasticity to the extra light capture in intercrops, um, there's a very simple thing you can do. You can simply replace the uh, plants that show the plastic phenotype, so the phenotype adapted to the intercrop, with uh, the phenotype of the plants as they grow in a monoculture. Uh, so to the right, you can see the plants as they uh, were growing in an intercrop. So this is faithful faithful to the uh, actual uh, intercrop experiment. But to the left, you can see the same intercrop setup. So a couple of maize, uh, wheat rows and two maize rows. But now the phenotype of the plants is, um, uh, are those from the, uh, from the soil crop. And this approach then allows you to uh, quantify the contribution of plant plasticity to the extra light capture and in intercrops. Um, you can see here in this figure on the, on the y-axis is the uh, accumulated PAR uh, over time, um, so for the whole season, um, the uh, the white bar. So SW is soil wheat, and SM is soil maize. So uh, these are the soil crops, and uh, the dotted line here is the expected accumulated absorption uh, based on one third of the soil wheat plus two thirds of the soil maize, because that is the uh, the land use proportion that these species have in an intercrop of wheat and maize. One third of the area is covered by wheat and two thirds is taken up by maize. So if you simply take the yields of the, um, of the monocrop and um, use these proportions, you can calculate an expected uh, total light interception of such an intercrop if the phenotypes would be identical to those in, the, uh, in a monocrop. If you then do the actual simulation, so you put together the phenotypes of wheat and maize as they grow in a monocrop, but you put them in an intercrop setup, um, then you can see the, uh, then you get the result as shown in the, in the third bar here. So this is the intercrop um, composed of soil crop phenotypes. And what we see is that this bar is higher than the dotted line which means that the light interception, the total light interception of this intercrop with the soil crop phenotypes is more than what can be expected based on the soil crop yield and the proportions uh, of these species in the intercrop. And this then can be attributed to the combined effect of plants being at the border 
and um, the temporal niche differentiation. Uh, so if you take exactly the same phenotypes as in the soul crop, you put them in an intercrop setup, the intercrop will intercept more light than could be expected based on uh, the soul crop yields. And then you can go further uh, by introducing the intercrop phenotypes. So the fourth bar here contains the soul wheat phenotype, but the intercrop maize phenotype. The fifth bar contains the intercropped wheat phenotype, but the soul crop maize phenotype. And then finally, the last bar is the actual intercrop. So the intercropped wheat phenotype and the intercropped maize phenotype in an intercrop setup. Um, so here, the um, the bars to compare are the third and the sixth bar, sixth bar. The third bar is the light capture by an intercrop with fully monocrop phenotypes, so soul crop phenotypes. And the last bar is the intercrop with intercrop phenotypes. So you can see you get extra light accumulated light capture over time um, if you have this plastic phenotype. So this allows you to quantify separately uh, the effect of plasticity on total light capture in an intercrop and border effect uh, and temporal niche differentiation on light capture in the intercrop. But such a model allows you to go even further because until now, uh, full phenotypes were used, either the soul crop phenotype or the intercrop phenotype, but it's also possible to change individual plant traits. So not the full phenotype, but individual traits. And this is what you see here. Uh, here again is um, a sort par on the y-axis and then on the x-axis on the left there's SW which is uh, soul wheat so we're focusing only on wheat here and um, on the right where it says full this is the full uh, intercrop phenotype so the soul wheat phenotype and the intercrop phenotype are respectively left and right and then different traits are put either uh, if uh, we're given either their soul crop value or their intercrop value. Um, and there's a couple of bars that are sticking out clearly. And those are the bars that have a T in them. And the T is for tillering. Um, so L is for increased leaf size. Uh, A is for uh, changing leaf angle, etc. These are a couple of traits here. But you can see clearly that all these bars that have the intercrop uh, tillering phenotype, so the number of tillers that you find in an intercrop, uh, this really contributes to this extra light capture. Um, so it is clear from this uh, modeling study, at least, uh, it suggests that um, the extra tillering that you get um, uh, gives you, um, a, it has a big contribution to the overall extra light capture. And it doesn't only allow you to conclude that, it also allows you to quantify how much extra light um, you're actually getting uh, uh, caused by these, uh, these different plant traits. Okay, now that was all about um, above ground resource uh, competition <coughs> for light. Um, but as mentioned in the introduction of this, uh, of this lecture, um, a lot is going on below ground as well that contributes to the performance of, of intercrops. Uh, depending on the type of system and the type of species uh, you're looking at, it may actually be uh, more important what's happening below ground uh, than what's happening above ground. So to exemplify some work in this domain, uh, I would like to give you an example of um, addressing the effect of changes in root angle for the performance of uh, wheat intercrop with, uh, with soybean using, um, using a simulation model. Uh, wheat intercrop with, uh, with soybean is a, is a well-known example of a, uh, a well-performing intercrop that is non-relay. So in, uh, in contrast to the, uh, the wheat maize system that we focused on before and also the uh, wheat cotton system. Uh, this system is non-relay, so both species are uh, are typically sown simultaneously. Um, and much of the um, much of the advantages that such a system brings compared to the soil crops can be traced back to what's happening below ground. Um, uh, one of the important reasons to include a legume like soybean in an intercrop is the fact that on uh, uh, in in nitrogen. Uh, limited conditions, the legume can uh, fix nitrogen from the air, thereby um, reducing the competition for soil nitrogen, which makes it more available to the component species, in this case wheat, that cannot fix nitrogen from the air. Um, so that gives clear advantages in nitrogen limited conditions, but also, as we will see in this example, even under non-nitrogen limiting conditions, uh, there are still 
um, uh, advantages to be uh, to be expected, um, albeit perhaps not on the whole system level. But uh, we'll get into some of the details in the coming slides. Now, this particular model that we used in this study is a little bit more advanced than the one from the uh, maize wheat example, because here we are using a model that actually grows uh, grows based on the resources that have been captured. In the previous example, what, what what's happened was the uh, the canopies, so the intercrop canopies were recreated, and the effect on light capture for the different phenotypes was quantified. Now, in this particular model, the light that is captured is actually driving the growth. So the leaves of these plants, they are capturing light, photosynthesizing, and this is driving the growth of the plants. At the same time, it is uh, also um, growing below ground so the the biomass the new biomass which is produced through photosynthesis is also growing uh, making sure that the roots are getting bigger and extending more the roots they uh, take up nitrogen from the soil this nitrogen is used in the leaves to determine the photosynthesis rate next to the light so this model is really a growth model of plants um, and the plants are driven by light capture as well as nitrogen uptake um, so here you can see uh, slices of the uh, of the fields we simulated, um, and the wheat is uh, present with two different root angles, either a large or a small angle. On the, on the bottom left, you can see the intercrop with a large angle uh, wheat plants, and to the right, you can see the small root angle. Uh, and on top, in small pictures, you can see the uh, respective um, monocrops. Now the purpose of this uh, small modeling exercise was to try and find out whether uh, different plant rates, in this case a different root angle, could actually contribute to the performance of species in an intercrop and perhaps even for the intercrop um, as a whole. And the idea behind that is that um, in uh, the current genotypes that are used in intercrops are actually bred to perform well in monocrops, in, in soil, soil crops. Um, so the idea is to try and find out first, explore using a model um, to see whether there is uh, actually opportunity for, uh, for breeding here, uh, to see whether um, some plant traits could have different trait values, could have different values that make them perform especially well in intercrops, something that may not uh, be noticed when breeding, uh, breeding only for, uh, for monocrops. And here are some of the results of this exercise. Um, this is yield per square meter of, uh, of species area in this case, um, and for, for the soybean and the wheat with the two different uh, wheat root angles, both in the intercrop and the soil crop. <coughs> uh, and the effect of the different uh, root angle uh, can be seen in the in the wheat as well as in the in the soybean. So with the large root angle, the wheat plants uh, are actually um, producing a little bit more uh, yield than with a small root angle. Uh, and we can also see that this goes at the expense of, uh, of what soybean is doing. So soybean is performing worse when wheat has a large root angle. Uh, we can also see here that the wheat plants, they do uh, uh, quite a bit better than in the soil crop. So the intercrop wheat outperforms the wheat in the soil crop, but the soybean plants actually perform worse than in the soil soybean uh, crop. And this is uh, reflected in the uh, the relative yields that we can see here. So the uh, the soybean relative yield is 0.2 uh, for the uh, for the case with the uh, large wheat root angle, uh, and the proportion in the field is actually 0.5. Uh, so the relative density was 0.5. So that means that soybean was underperforming compared to the soil crop. Wheat, however, was overperforming, was overyielding. So it had a uh, with a large uh, root angle, it had a relative yield of 0 0.68. Uh, but this then amounted to a total relative yield. This is uh, the same as the length equivalent ratio that we saw earlier um, of only 0 0.88. So as a whole, this system is not performing uh, any better. Uh, it's actually performing worse than the, uh, than the, than the soil crops. Uh, irrespective of the wheat root angle, we do see that uh, with a large angle, wheat is doing better, uh, but soybean is doing worse. So in the end, the total relative yield um, is the same. And the modeling allows us to go uh, to dig a little bit deeper. If we look at this, uh, this wheat root angle and we, we have a look at the uh, total plant nitrogen uptake 
uh, so the total uptake during the lifetime of the plant for the wheat plants in the different uh, rows within the wheat strip. So in this particular configuration, we have five wheat rows within the strip, um, and you can see a very clear difference between the situation with a large and with a small root angle. Uh, the plants in row one and row five, they take up much more nitrogen um, than the rows in the middle, but also then rows one and five in the case of a small uh, uh, wheat root angle. And this is, of course, something that's expected if you look at these pictures uh, with a large angle, the wheat plants at the border. So uh, row one and five, uh, they, they stick their roots in the domain of the soybean. Um, so they are actually taking away resources from soybean and use them for themselves. So this gives the overyielding in the wheat plants, but also results in uh, underperformance of the soybean plants. And this is something that is less or not uh, visible in the case of the small uh, uh, root angle of the wheat. Uh, so this means that there is clearly opportunity for um, higher performance of a component crop in an intercrop. Uh, such as um, having a large angle for, uh, for wheat, something that is not seen uh, when you grow them in a monocrop. However, here this goes at the expense of the soybean uh, so much that uh, overall the whole system is not interesting because it's underperforming. Uh, so that means that when optimizing trades for, for a better competition below ground, it means that uh, yeah, this needs to be taken into account for both species and not just for one, spe one of the two species as uh, was done in this study. So in a nutshell, uh, intercrops um, in many cases for many different uh, combinations of species and uh, environmental conditions can give uh, yield benefits. Uh, some of the drivers of this overyielding uh, can be canopy, canopy structure, so the way the canopy is built up related to the number of borders. Uh, temporal overlap or temporal niche differentiation and plasticity of the plants um, of the of the of the shoot part of the plants. This give uh, this may give increased light capture, depending on the extent of the temporal overlap and the differences between the species, etc. Um, also below ground, uh, higher yields uh, can be uh, can be obtained uh, through different root niches if uh, if the roots are taking up their nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients from different. Uh, locations in the soil, uh, different depths, for example, or at different moments in time, um, as well as through facilitation of nutrient acquisition. So the uh, active uh, helping of one species uh, for the other, taking up the uh, uh, nutrients from the soil. So this uh, concludes the, uh, this introductory lecture on uh, resource use in intercrops. Um, obviously, this is just uh, scratching the surface. We've been looking at light, we've been looking at uh, nitrogen. Uh, we've seen uh, which concepts are, are at play here and how modeling can be used to analyze uh, how, uh, what is the relative importance of a competition for different resources uh, for the performance of an intercrop. Uh, there's a large body of literature on uh, other aspects of uh, intercrops, other uh, forms of plasticity, for example, uh, focusing on different resources like water and phosphorus that we didn't touch upon in this lecture. Um, here you can see the, uh, the references of the papers that are used in this lecture, but if you're interested in, in anything more, uh, I'll be happy to provide you with uh, additional literature. Um, so thanks for your attention.